Hi, welcome to a, a bit of a conversation here outside of Brockton Community Access, the new and improved, if you haven't had a chance to stop by one Main Street, uh, I suggest that you do. Joining me here for the conversation, I'll be in a brief one. It's election season. We have State Representative Michelle Dubois. Hi, Kevin. I'm so happy to be here with you. It's impromptu, but exciting. Yeah, we're out here on the lawn. I love the lawn. And yeah. of course, uh, City Councilor, uh, one-time Mayor, and candidate for State Senate, Moses Rodriguez. Hi, Kevin. Thank you very much for having me and us. Uh, it's an honor to be here and have a, a conversation. I'm glad that the uh, the uh, Democratic City Committee put this uh, whole thing together and uh, I want to give them a shout out for all the work that they do here in the city of Brockton and also BCA for hosting this event. Yeah, and that's that, that's <coughs> worth noting as well is, is this is in fact being brought to you by the Brockton City Committee, uh, the Brockton Democratic City Committee, uh, and of course co-sponsored with Brockton Community Access. So what has it been like for you guys? We, we got a few days left until the big primary representative what has it been like for you campaigning during COVID? So you know I just want to tell everybody how honored I am to be their state representative. Uh, I've been really enjoyed these last three years and COVID has really um, been a real difficult thing for the city and I know that um, Councillor Rodriguez and yourself know that. Um, I want to echo his sentiments around the Brockton Democratic City Committee. I want to thank them for hosting this and um, What's happened in, during this last term is so much has been caught up with COVID, but my aide, Ann, is a professional um, social worker, which is why I hired her. She's from Brockton, and she understands the needs of communities like Brockton, and COVID has really turned our office, which is really my kitchen table now, because the speaker asked us not to go into the state house and to work from home, into um, more of a social work um, clinic. And so I'm still doing budget and trying to get money home for the district, but a lot of services around um, COVID. We have a volunteer mask making team, so we deliver a free mask to senior citizens. We've delivered around 2,000, and the woman that is sewing, the, doing the majority of them, has made 3,500. She gives some to the um, Charity Guild as well to give away. Um, I've created a COVID uh, resource guide and just trying to be a backstop for people. A lot of people are, um, we're delivering diapers to people, food to people. That's really where we've transitioned to because Brockton is in need right now. And so that has been my focus. And then I've worked with the delegation and the mayor um, and the city council to try to deliver more services for the city around COVID, the, the testing facility up at Brockton High School. And one thing that I am really most proud of is that I've always been a transparency, open government person. And when I ever heard that Governor Baker, who, you know, hasn't really, he hasn't really been doing a bad job. So I'm not, I'm not trying to give him negative um, grade. I'm just saying everybody deserves some criticism. When I heard that he wasn't offering municipality-based COVID results, that, that became my number one issue for a long time. We wrote letters, the mayor created the Health um, Equity Task Force, and we wrote a letter from our group demanding that the governor release municipal level data, and 10 days after we submitted that letter, he did, and then we demanded that we get race and ethnicity data, because I was talking to folks like Moses, who was telling me that he, he knew of people that were in the Cape Verdean community who were experiencing high numbers of uh, fatalities, and he was really advocating for them. And so, I, and they're my they're my constituents, and I want to make sure that the governor is telling everybody what's really happening, so we can depend we can demand that the resources go to where the need is, which is what COVID that, that's what should happen. Okay, Moses being uh, the mayor, and now the at, back to being the at large counselor. It's almost like being the, the mayor because you field calls and conversations from everybody. Running for state uh, state senate, uh, what's it been like running for state senate uh, during COVID nineteen? Field. Well, Kevin, it's uh, it's been somewhat challenging in the sense because you're not able to have these uh, open wide uh, communities uh, get together as we we're used to in the in the past. But at the same time, it hasn't really prevented us from uh, reaching out and touching the community in the sense. As you know, I, um, I work at the Cape Verdean Association, and the reason why I'm going to bring the Cape Verdean Association up is that going back to the end of uh, April, we opened the center back up again, and it has become a, a center that's providing assistance to 
Bractonians, and it's called the Cape Verdean Association, but the only thing Cape Verdean about the Cape Verdean Association is its name. Uh, we've spent a great deal of time providing uh, uh, unemployment assistance with individuals because, to be honest with you, and I, and I said this the other day, I think at, at your show when we were doing this, uh, the people up in Beacon Hill that actually decides on how these programs actually work have never once applied for unemployment or have not applied for food stamps or welfare or any of the programs that you might look at. So the, the fact that it takes you an hour to get hold of somebody to talk to about your rights, your, your, um, your, the benefits that you're entitled to, uh, to me it's, it's mind-boggling in the sense. And I'm glad we have community-based organizations that spend a great deal of time. I mean, uh, just to give you an example, in terms of, in terms of uh, we're outside, so people are driving by and waving at us. So, uh, in, in terms of spending, uh, providing direct services to the community, I believe when I last checked, we had gone over the six hundred, uh, the sixty-five thousand dollars worth of uh, gift cards that we actually have provided to people in this community. And these are fifty-dollar gift cards, so you can just basically figure that out how many gift cards or how many families actually have benefited from this program. We've provided um, somewhere around uh, 1,800 families have gone through looking for help with rental assistance. I mean, every time something comes up in terms of people looking for services and you hear uh, politicians just tossing out all these names of organizations and agencies that provide assistance, but uh, I think very few of them actually have gone in and checked to see how readily available those services are or how the community can actually take advantage from those uh, specific programs and it's not as easy i mean i hear people talking about well there's rental assistance everywhere try applying for rental assistance and see how how encumbersome of a program it actually is um, so that's what we're trying to do during this period but at the same time demanding some things from the state and i don't mean the uh, the, the elected folks from our community because i think Honestly, our state reps do uh, the job that they're doing with the limitations that they actually have. They do a pretty good job. I mean, I actually have had some positive uh, experiences with the, with the state reps down in the, uh, in the city area. The issue that I, I and, a, and a lot of us in city government have had is with the person sitting at the Senate, uh, at the Senate level. You know, that's not doing what they could, what he could. To, to be able to assist this community even further. And that's the reason why I'm running uh, for that office. What are you? Can I just butt in here for a second? You I want to say that um, Moses is completely right in that um, being a state rep, I grew up in real serious poverty. And so I understand what the folks that are calling me are going through. Um, as an example, today we helped an 80 year old woman fill out a food stamp application. She, like she had, she's wearing dentures that are 30 years old. We're gonna help her try to find new dentures. I mean, there are, there are things that are going on at our level. I had a dad of four kids call me. He's two months behind on his rent. And um, he was like $1,000 over the, um, the raft threshold. cap. And so I talked to the mayor and to the governor and to the speaker of the house and said, we need to get that gap filled. And they did respond. So they put money in to do rental assistance from 50 to 80% of the median income. And there's just, when you, you are from the community where people are struggling, you see these things. I did learn hardly anybody in Brockton has a computer. Like so many people don't have a computer here. So when people say it's so easy, it's not so easy when like half of the people in Brockton don't have a computer to sign up for unemployment by the computer. It's, it's, it's a tough time here in the city. Does COVID-19, does that kind of, when you're out, you're campaigning, or if you're doing Zoom meet and greets, do you find that, that COVID-19 and the pandemic is dominating? So you're not really getting to some of the real problems other than people's needs because of the pandemic. Well, I'll say that um, when you um, are two months behind on rent and you don't have any food, and you're not signed up for food stamps because you've always been too proud to take public assistance and you have three kids to feed, um, that service that we're providing actually is um, actually is part of what they need for their real lives. So, I mean, 
I think what we're doing here is we're filling this gap right now. COVID is real. It is all encompassing. And it, from school education to parents, I think all the parents at home should know that they don't have to buy a laptop, that the city is going to supply that for them. You don't know how many moms have called me so stressed out saying we don't even really have a lot of money for food. How are we going to be able to afford a laptop? Right. And they don't realize that this, the city is going to provide that this time where they didn't last time to everyone because they ran out or for whatever reason. So there's a lot of fear because everybody wants to do a good job being a mom and a dad. And um, in a COVID pandemic, when your employer shuts down the place, or even worse, like when a mom has three kids and their employer is saying, you have to come back, or I'm gonna call unemployment and get you kicked off, and she calls me crying, and I tell her, no, the law says that you can, if you have to stay at home, you can stay at home. So I'm being that kind of a backstop, and I'm a compassionate person. I'm really um, empathetic, and so this type of work is really what I gravitate toward. So I wish I didn't have to do it, but it's really what is encompassing most of my time right now. How about you, Moses? Are you feeling, you hear it when you're talking to people and you want to get their idea as to what they'd like you to do if you're elected? Um, well, first off, if, if you were able to get the, uh, the primary nod, and then November, what are some of the things they're, they're talking to you about as a, as a candidate? Is it more focused on COVID-19 or are there really issues there? I think it's a combination of both. Uh, I mean, one of the issues, let, let, let's be real, let, let's be real and realistic. COVID-19 is here to stay for possibly, you know, possibly the next six, seven, eight months, uh, maybe coming around the corner as the new year comes around. Yep. So we got to get used to and, and realize that it's here to stay. Uh, but the issues that, were, that I, I actually have a problem with is the fact that our community never gets its fair share of things. Um, you look at some of the other communities, how well they do uh, with programs for the youth, with programs for the seniors, with programs for the immigrant population. I know that we spend a great deal of time sometimes defending or advocating for the immigrant populations. I mean, we all know that Brockton is a, a very diverse community, but at times uh, there is not a, not a, a lot of push to basically advocate for those individuals. You know, you've got, you look at the Adult Learning Center has a waiting list of people who are waiting to learn English, and that list is around eight, uh, 1,800 people. You look at the association, we have English classes up there. We have two classes that we can't do anymore because we don't have the spaces to do so. And then you look at the state in the sense, what resources is coming back into the community to help us deal with those issues? We have an office at the, uh, at the state level called the Massachusetts Office of Refugee and Immigrants. Do you know how many dollars comes into Brockton from that uh, office? The number is zero. You know, this is one of the more, again, diverse uh, immigrant communities in, uh, in Massachusetts. We get absolutely no support from those offices because I feel that, uh, again, we don't have the, the so-called the unified force advocating for the city of Brockton. We've got these poor state reps doing what they can with the resources that they have, but at the same time, we don't have that unified force. I mean, I'm gonna go as far as saying, you look at the city of New Bedford, for instance, where you have uh, Senator Montigny. Uh, last year, he brought in over a million dollars worth of appropriations into the New Bedford region. What did we get in this city, you know? Uh, I have some stats that I actually found, which is to me is mind-boggling, and this has, not, has nothing to do with COVID or Corona or anything else. But you look at the uh, the uh, the welfare office, the DTA office. They have uh, a training program where they actually kind of train individuals to uh, to be able to get a job and get out of the welfare system. Uh, just to give you an example, um, the city of Fall River last year in the 2020 budget, they had over a million dollars in their budget from this office to help the unemployed people in this community. Do you know what Brockton got? $143,000. You know, you look at New Bedford, $835,000. We that have the bigger need, $143,000. So the issue is that we're not getting the advocacy from that level that we could get from the senior person within the state legislature. And I that's will say, one of the I'm very I'm proud of the work that I've done, and I'm here about um, a campaign that we were 
we had a planned debate and my opponent um, quit yesterday and didn't show up and um, he said that he had concerns about um, the Democratic City Committee and some members and so my thing is is if you have concern about your own Brocktonians and your own de Democratic Party as a Democratic primary what are you going to do when you go up into the state house where it is um, a majority Democrat Repub uh, Democrat members who have all different ideas and all different wants and are real tough cookies and I, you have to go in and you have to do your best and you have to show up and you, ha you know, 90% of doing a job is showing up. You know, I think there's more to it than that, but that's what some people say. And I just want to, I just want to say that during my time as a state representative, I have gotten the state. The state has redone four playgrounds in my district. That has been a priority for me. I grew up poor. Playgrounds were important places for me as a child. It's good for people to have places they can go where their kids can play basketball and be healthy and have healthy resources out there. We've redone McKinley Park. Um, and my opponent says, oh, the Patriots did it. But I got $175,000 worth of earmarks that seeded the money. We redid the basketball court for the Patriots to come and donate the play structure. And my earmarks paid for the fence and the, and the swing set. I mean, it's a teamwork. You don't do anything by yourself. So I did that. We've given earmarks to uh, the Haitian community partners to do a youth, youth financial uh, program, to Cape Verdean Association for a summer literacy program. I'm not saying it's million of dollars but I am fighting for this district every day and um, that includes West Bridgewater and East Bridgewater too so I really um, I just wanted to say that that I think we can always do better everyone can always do better um, but from my perspective um, I, I believe that the, the funding that I've delivered to this district has been important and you can't say to that kid that now has a playground who never had a playground before that it's unimportant like at East Junior High I mean, we put in a, bat, a third basketball court there, a play structure. That's just phase one and phase two. And you know, if maybe if I was in leadership, maybe I could have gotten that whole playground down with three hundred thousand dollars and not had to break it up over two years. Maybe, but I would really have to compromise a lot of my independence. And like um, um, Moses said, I, I mean, Brockton is different than some of the North Shore towns and the wealthy towns that their communities don't need financial um, money being funneled into their community. They can have all these high principled and they can try to climb that ladder. But what I want to do is I want to make sure that the people that grew up like me and working class families that struggled every day, that they can go out and have a place to go play on a swing set every once in a while and that our schools are well funded. That has been a huge, huge push for me. One of the bills that I filed got brought into the Student Opportunity Act. That's going to bring $2 billion into public education over seven years and $100 million into Brockton. That's a big deal. I grew, I graduated from Brockton High School. My opponent didn't. And um, I graduated from Brockton High School in 91 when school funding was really poor, like it is now. There was a lawsuit over it. The legislature failed to act. So when I got up to the State House, my goal was I am not going to let down this generation of students like my generation of students was let down. And I focused really a lot of effort on making sure that leadership heard that. And when I had personal meetings with Speaker DeLeo, like there would be a shooting here and we'd, we'd, meet, we'd sit down and we'd talk about it. And he said, Michelle, what can we do? And I said, we can fund education. That's what we can do. If you want to help, you can fund education. And that's what we did. So I'm also very proud of that. And so I just wanted to take this opportunity to participate. So thank you. And again, this is a conversation uh, with the uh, candidates for office being brought to you by the Brockton Democratic City Committee and Brockton Community Access says we are uh, right outside of One North Main Street. If you can hear this, a lot of the sights and the sounds that are that are happening in downtown Brockton. And it's almost like the, the, the morning show, the Boston area TV station that does their morning show on the road every Friday and I'm sure they don't have as many no noises as we do but uh, it's good to have this conversation. Michelle you, you had mentioned in regards to hoping that Brockton can get as much money as a New Bedford. What, what makes New Bedford any different than Brockton? I, I think that's what Moses said. I think said. Moses did but I think you kind of you. Oh we can, we can push it over here if you want. Um, <laughs> you know I, I gotta say in a lot of ways, Moses and I have a lot of the similar thinkings on things. Yeah. And I, I just, you know, nothing, nothing against his opponent, who I think is a fine human being and a good person. And so I'm just here to talk about my race. Yep. Um, 
but you know, I, I can't really compare the cities. Um, I just think that Brockton is a great place to live and they have great people here and I really am attracted to struggle. And I think a, a person that goes through struggle and adversity is a stronger person for it. I will say that the legislature um, has a lot of affluence in its membership. And in the Senate, there's only one person of color. So, I mean, Brockton is a minority majority city, a minority non-white city. So I, I think that we do need more representation, but you know, nothing against Moses opponent because I like him very much too. And I'm not advocating for anybody, you vote whatever way you want, folks. I'm asking for your vote um, on, Sept on September 1 for my race and that I'm honored to be your state representative of. So I love Brockton, New Bedford's fun. Your thoughts in regards to how is New, New Bedford able to, to pull that kind of money well, and, and not Brockton? Well, uh, I honestly think it's, uh, it's based on advocacy. Um, it's plain and simple advocacy when you sit down and think about, <coughs> when you sit down and think about it. Um, we, New Bedford has a great advocate in the Senate. Just like some of the other major cities in Massachusetts have a great they have great advocates in the uh, in the Senate, and we do not. I mean, we got to be realistic, you know. And I can speak directly to the voters because I have been being a city councilor for all these years. I've been in the city council now, going into my seventh year, so I know what comes into the city. And being a mayor uh, last year, I knew basically firsthand what came into play, so that we could actually. Uh, utilize those resources that were coming in for us to implement some of the programs and and frankly from the Senate side of things I saw absolutely nothing. Michelle is absolutely right in terms of providing these community-based organizations with some uh, with some needed funds but when you look at some of these other community organizations that are getting from the Senate side from the Senate side thousands and thousands of dollars that we're not getting that's what the that's the main reason for me to come out and basically challenge the status quo uh, it's very difficult for somebody like myself who's been um, you know I mean let's be realistic um, I'm, I'm a minority uh, somebody that was born overseas uh, to come in and basically challenge a uh, an incumbent it's very difficult because I've been struggling most of my adult life for equality you know whereas uh, my opponent has had a life of privilege that uh, he has lived and the reason why I say a life of privilege is because some of the actions that he's actually gotten away with uh, if he was someone of color I doubt that he could get away with that stuff so uh, that's why I basically state that he has lived a life of privilege whereas with somebody like myself it's been a struggle all my life for everything I do or I have accomplished in my life it's been a struggle uh, from going to college, from going to the, uh, into the service, the military, uh, from doing the, uh, to, to run for elected, elected position here in the city. Uh, it's been a struggle. It's been a struggle to try to, I mean, I hear this all the time. Oh, if the Cape Verdeans vote for you, you could become a uh, U.S. president or you could become a governor. So I'm not good enough to get the general vote. I have to sit here and wait until the minorities vote for me in order for me to get anywhere. Uh, and that's totally unfair because the other individuals are not doing that kind of stuff. They're, you're voting for them because they have the capabilities of doing the job or not, not because of the skin color. I, I have to say, though, this is what's interesting about, about each of your races. And I'm going to take this over for a moment before I, I kind of give you guys your last word. Is, is that it's not like you each are facing individuals who are perennial candidates. These are individuals, you yourself, you hold office. Your opponent hold, holds an office. Michelle, you've, hold, you've held office, um, not only here in the city, but now on the state level. I was a Ward 6 city councilor for 10 years, and, five terms, and, and, you're, yeah, and you're my right. third term as a state representative, an honor to be. And then your, your, your opponent is an elected official in Brockton. What is it like knowing that, see, Brockton could be, you know, it's, it's, a, a, Demo, it's a Democrat stronghold. Do you feel that it's gonna, you're going to be battling for the votes here in Brockton? When it comes so, to your district. I believe that, you know, it's a Democratic stronghold, and I think that's why um, my opponent changed his party designation um, to Democrat to run against me, because he knew that he would never win as a Republican. And so I think that's why he didn't come today to the, to the, to the debate hosted by, because I would much prefer, no offense to you gentlemen, to be here talking about issues with my opponent who, who canceled yesterday. And I really wish that he was here so we could have this dialogue 
So in 2016, in the presidential primary, I pulled a Democratic ballot. He pulled a Republican ballot. He wants to buy the desal plant. I do not want to buy the desal plant. He was for the power plant. He's quoted in the Enterprise saying he thought it would be good for the city. I fought for 15 years to stop it. So we're, we're different, and I want the people to know how we're different. And it's, I've never had an opponent who's refused to debate me before, and it's just sad. So I hope that we can make it work. We got about five minutes left. Uh, anything you want to kind of mention in regards in regards to knowing that Brockton is? It's it. You'll be looking for as many. Uh, you know, again, your district is a little bit more vast because it's the state senate district. But Brockton, I think, is going to be the battleground. Wrong? Am I right or wrong? I, I think it is, but I, I don't see it as uh, as it as it being a Democrat or not Democrat. I think we're looking at now. The voters in this city are well educated, and they understand what the situation is, and they can see you know, the issues themselves. It, and it's no longer what it used to be, where, you know, if you're an incumbent and you basically, you know, have a stronghold in a particular group that you are gonna hold on to that group. I think I think people are basically looking at at the capabilities of the individuals, you know, whether or not you can actually do the job and, and versus where you are, where you're not. So uh, I'm, I'm actually proud of the fact that I am from Brockton, true and true. Uh, I, I know no other city in America. I wasn't born in Brockton, but I know no other city in this country in terms of uh, being a, uh, a maternal city to me. I mean, I've spent more time in Brockton than I've spent any place else. And I, I pride myself in the fact that I graduated from Brockton High. Yes, I didn't have an opportunity to go to the junior highs or elementary school any place else because I got, here, <laughs> I got here when I was 16. Yeah. So I went straight to Brockton High School, didn't speak a lick of English, wow. you know. And, and now what, you don't even have an accent. I make it up as I go along. Mm -hmm. and, and what I learned is the fact that, that this is a very accommodating city. It's a city that, that basically rewards individuals that work hard. And I believe that I, I've done that through, you know, through and through, you know, through running for city council, holding on to the mayor's seat, and basically uh, doing some, uh, some decent work while I was mayor in this city. Uh, and taking over a real tough situation, to be honest with you, that I encountered when I came in into the mayor's office. So, and that's the reason why I'm doing this. It's, it's, it's not because I'm looking to promote myself beyond a certain thing, because you've been a mayor of a city, you've been a city councilor. I'm the top vote getter in the, in the council. I could sit there and, become, and continue to be a councilor for as long as I want to be. But the point is, there's, the, there's a need to step up and do something in terms of uh, bettering the lives of the residents of this city and that's the reason why I'm doing this. Again, chances are I will uh, I will lose financially by you know by going into the Senate than I would for my own job but at the same time you know it's an honor and privilege to look at the, at the, at the voters in this city and ask them for their support on this on the first. All right, so just quickly, folks want to find out about your campaign, Michelle, how can I do that? So my website is www.dubois, the number four, staterep.com. So um, dubois4staterep.com. I hope you check it out. Moses? Listen, I have a web page, a website. I have, I'm on Facebook, but here's my phone number. It's 508-386-5816. It's listed on the city's uh, uh directory you can call me anytime you want to and we can have a dialogue excellent i would like both of you for having a conversation with me a little bit of a conversation with the candidates outside impromptu impromptu, impromptu right? we did this with no notes no right. script just here having a conversation uh, we want to thank you at home we want to thank the folks from the brockton democratic city committee and brockton community access their fine staff thank phil you everybody deb and patrick for putting this all together uh don't forget to get out and vote september 1st uh that's the primary no, if you, if you don't know where to vote, call the folks over at City Hall. And how uh, about you can register until the 22nd? There you go. You can register online by till the 22nd of this month. Easy enough to do. So, with that, we thank you for tuning in. Have a good day. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.